Hello? I, can, can everybody hear me in the back? You're okay? Okay, excellent. Somehow my screen flickers, but what to do? Okay. Grüezi miteinander. Excuse my German or Swiss German. Unfortunately, I'm still learning. Maybe you can help me learn. Uh, welcome to Digital Circuits or Digital Technik. Uh, I hope you're here for this. If you're not, this is the right time to leave, probably. <laughs> Unless you're You're welcome to stay if you want to learn more, more about what's written over here. I assume all of you are first year. I guess I start early. That's, it's better to be early than late. <laughs> you're all first year students? Yes? Excellent. You're excited about this? Okay. <laughs> That was not a strong yes, but hopefully it'll be a yes by the end of the course. I'm very excited about all of this stuff, so hopefully I will convey uh, why I'm excited about this to you. Uh, and the goal of the first two lectures today and tomorrow is really to give you an overview or to uh, cover, uh, to discuss what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the course. Now, this course is going to be a very uh, tough course, not to scare you, but to show you that we're serious here at ETH uh, about computer science and everything. Uh, but I want to give you an overview of why this is an exciting time to study what we're going to study in this course. Because this is going to be the, really the building block for the rest of computer science that you're going to see uh, in the future in your career. If you know this really well, then I believe you're going to be able to solve any kind of problem that comes in front of you. So hopefully you'll pay a lot of attention. If you can pay attention while playing uh, computer games, that's okay too. <laughs> Just make sure the computer game doesn't cause interference to people around you. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Uh, I'm, I'm Onur Mutlu. I'll introduce myself later in the course. Uh, I've been here very little uh, before I used to teach at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I came here in May and September, uh, and I'm teaching here now. Uh, but I'll introduce myself and the other course staff hopefully today, if not tomorrow. So let's start with some puzzles, actually. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll challenge you in the first few parts of the lecture. And hopefully you'll answer me. What is this? Well, this is it's a slide, of course. But clearly, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you what this is. Oh, you guys are good. <laughs> it's Stadelhofen, right? It's a beautiful view. It's another view of it, right? What, what, what comes to your mind when you look at this thing? <laughs> Nothing? <laughs> Circuits? How is it? Yes? I step away from the platform. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good thing, yes, exactly. <laughs> Architecturally anything? <laughs> Do you guys know who it is designed by? Yes. Exactly, Calatrava. Okay, I'll tell you more about Calatrava. You spoiled it because I, I thought a few people would know, but not everybody. Who knows about Calatrava? Excellent. So you'll, uh, the first assignment is to learn about Calatrava. <coughs> And I will give you that assignment in a little bit. But I, I, the, when, I, when I first went there, actually, I, I first uh, went to Stadelhofen uh, when I uh, interviewed at ETH last year, uh, or the previous year, And I, I really enjoyed it. It's beautiful. I think it's one of the, one of the most beautiful train stations uh, that I've been to, in my opinion. Well, of course, that's my opinion because I'm telling you that. But uh, it's small, but there, there's this beauty to it. So look at these things that are uh, supporting the upper platform over here. Right? They're, they're not straight. They're really angled. And uh, you can see other... Look at the bridge over here, right? It's... Uh, there is some sort of aesthetic beauty in it that's hard to, hard to talk about. I'll show you some other examples. This is another view of it. Hopefully, if you, if you didn't recognize it the first time, hopefully it's coming to you. This is the opposite view. How many people recognize this place now? It's Bahnhof Stadelhofen. 
Okay, excellent. How many people don't recognize it? You have not. You have never been there. Uh, or, I guess uh, this is a different question, right? How many people don't recognize it, and how many people don't recognize it that have never been there? Okay, that's a small group. So I will encourage you to go there and think about it in a different way. Uh, it didn't always used to look like this. This is what it used to look like in 1983. How many of you were there in 1983? <laughs> yeah? Really? You can raise your hand, that's okay. <laughs> I was certainly not there in 1983. I was still alive. <laughs> How many of you were alive in 1983? I see one hand, I think. <laughs> That's okay. There's no need. We don't discriminate here. You can be old, young. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you can take this course. No problem. <laughs> but uh, you, can, you, can look at the, you can see the difference, I think. Uh, well, this picture doesn't convey it that much, the, these two, but uh, others do. And this is 1967. Even older, right? There's some other sort of beauty into it, but it's, it's not the same, perhaps. Okay, I'll ask you another question. I think you've spoiled it, but... Uh, what do the following have in common uh, going forward? So this is another place in Lisbon, Garda do Oriente, with my terrible Portuguese. Internals look kind of similar, right? You can, you can kind of see there's a principle here, right? That's, it's, it's like the skeleton of a bird or something like that that's really supporting the platforms. Hmm. <laughs> You haven't been there, but you can imagine there's some similarity here. Well, another one, uh, a newer work, Milwaukee Art Museum. It's becoming more grandiose, maybe. But the, the, the principles are looking similar. Maybe they're growing in different ways, and maybe uh, they're becoming more expensive also, by the way. <laughs> this is Athens Olympic Stadium, 2004. This is... Another beautiful uh, building. Has anyone been to any of these? Which one? This one? Oh, okay, cool. I intend to go to all of them. It's another one. It's actually alive, if you will. That's like a bird flying. And another view of the same building, that flying bird, right? Maybe it's not a bird, but it's some bug over here that's, in <laughs> that's consumed by some other bug or something like that. I don't know. You can interpret it in different ways that you would like, right? <laughs> What's clear that, well, <laughs> leave your interpretations to yourselves. <laughs> uh, but this is another one. This is one of the last and perhaps the most controversial ones, right? The Oculus. Uh, this picture actually doesn't do justice to it, I think. And I, 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 I worked really hard to find a picture that do, does justice to this. I couldn't find one. If you find one, please let me know. It's very hard to do justice to this with a, pic, with a single picture. Uh, you have to really be there and go uh, look around. And I, I, I guess the, the fact that it's situated uh, underneath all of these skyscrapers make it hard, harder to find a picture or take a picture that does justice to this. So, what do all of these have co in common with Bahnhof Stadelhofen? No one? Who's hand? You guys shout? Because it's hard to see everyone here. Yes? Yeah, exactly. The architect is Kalatrava. So, all of these were done by Kalatrava. Uh, last one being probably the most controversial one. It cost about $4 billion. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll, I'll show you another architect who actually likes more expensive buildings. But uh, these are all beautiful buildings. So this is Bahnhof, Schadelhofen, and all designed by a famous architect. Actually an ETA alumnus in civil engineering. Did you know this too? About Kalatrava? Yeah, he came here after uh, he got his uh, architecture degree in Spain. Uh, he did uh, a PhD in civil engineering. And, of course, like this is uh, Stadelhofen actually was one of his first big jobs, if you will. It's considered a big job. He started, I believe, uh, in 1983, and he finished in 1989, 1990 or so. 
uh, and it, you can see uh, an explanation of this. The train station has several of the features that became signatures of his work. Straight lines and right angles are rare, and it's more zoomorphic uh, uh, architecture, which, I, which we will talk about. And this is him, and this is what Wikipedia tells us about him, uh, assuming you believe it. But it's, <laughs> it's relatively believable in this case. Uh, he's a Spanish architect, structural engineer, sculptor, and painter. Uh, he actually has an office in Zurich. I think he partially lives in Zurich right now, too. But you can see that whose sculptural forms often resemble living organisms. And you can argue which one is uh, his best work. This is where you can argue with Wikipedia and go and change it, and somebody else changed it again. And so you have the consistency problem, right? It's just like processors. We're going to talk about processors. People have the consistency problem over here in Wikipedia. You change it, and someone else changes it, and you get garbage, maybe. Processors do the same thing, right? If two processors are operating on the same memory location, one of them can update it, and the other can update it. And if they're updating it not inside the exact same location, but in some other copy that they created, now they may have a problem with the consistency of the data. Right? And this is actually one of the big problems in computer architecture, how you scale systems to a larger number of cores, number of processors. How do you solve that consistency problem becomes difficult. We'll get to this. If you don't understand this perfectly, no problem. But I, I like uh, thinking about analogies of life uh, when, when I think about architecture because in the end, what we design is a reflection of what we do in life also at some level. Don't take that too far. <laughs> okay, uh, so your first assignment, even if you may have been there, is to go and visit Bahnhof Stadelhofen. It's not that hard, I think, for many of you. An extra credit, repeat for any other college travel building. <laughs> Until you reach the end. By the way, this is an example of an algorithm also. We will talk about an algorithm in a little bit. Uh, an algorithm has uh, precise steps. And I tell you a precise step. Go and visit Bahnhof Stadelhofen. And the second is repeat for any other college travel building. Assuming you have a finite list of Calatrava buildings, you can define a precise step for each of the steps of this algorithm, right? And an algorithm, uh, an algorithm has three properties. I'm foreshadowing some of the slides, but one is that each step has to be precise. Each step has to be effectively computable, meaning it has to be. Uh, you, you should be able to carry out carry it out as a human. In this case, it's a human algorithm. If it's a computer algorithm, the computer should be able to carry out each step. Right. In this case, I hope you'll be, you, you are able to carry out and go all of the buildings. Of course, that's dependent on financial constraints and what, what not. But it is possible uh, to carry it out, assuming other conditions are satisfied. And the last important piece of an algorithm is, what is it? Have you guys learned about what an algorithm is in the past? Probably not. Yes? So you can tell me what it is. <laughs> Maybe not. Where did you learn about an algorithm, by the way? It has to yeah, exactly. It has to terminate. That's the third, third critical thing. And in this case, because the list of buildings is finite, the algorithm should be able to terminate, right? Okay. Well, now you can, you can execute this human algorithm as part of your first assignment. I'm happy if you just go to Bahnhof Stadelhofen. Uh, and I, I would uh, encourage you to appreciate the beauty and the out-of-the-box and creative thinking uh, of the structure. Uh, and think about the trade-offs in the design of the Bahnhof. Uh, and you, you will come up with many, after, especially after this course, but I think even before taking this course, you can come up with many in terms of the trade-offs that are made in terms of cost, space, functionality, dot, dot, dot. We apply these to computers also, actually. Cost is a big consideration in any, any computer we design here. Uh, but you can trade off cost for other things sometimes, right? Energy efficiency is a big consideration. Performance is a big consideration. Reliability is a big consideration. Availability is a big consideration. How much it burns your hand is a big consideration, right? Whether it actually catches fire <laughs> should not be a consideration probably, but that's these things happen, right? Because people trade off in different ways. Maybe they go too aggressive in some of the trade-offs. As a result, they may sacrifice reliability, right? Uh, and you can think about the strengths, weaknesses, and the goals of the design. It's always good to think about that whenever you go to 
uh, an architectural building. Or think about a computer. Like the, these two are different things. And that's clearly a different thing that has some computational power in it also. Uh, and due date is any time during this course. And you can feel free to email uh, us about it. Uh, but later during the course is better, I think, because the weather is better, probably. Uh, but also, you will hopefully learn more about how to make these trade-offs. Uh, and uh, you, will, you will also see the bu basic building blocks of computers uh, going forward. And you can apply what you have learned in this course and hopefully going forward, think out of the box. Uh, what I really love about the, uh, these kind of architects is they're really thinking out of the box and they're really pushing the boundaries of architecture or people who are doing computer architecture, they're pushing the boundaries of computer architecture, engineering, science. And I think that's critical. Uh, as ETA students, that's, I think, critical for you to uh, learn. Because that's actually one of the big missions of ETH, right? It's, uh, it's founded to uh, create people who can leap uh, Switzerland forward uh, in, uh, in both uh, government and management and in science, all of those at the same time. Okay, but first, let's come to today. Is everybody happy with this assignment? It's easy to do? Okay, who's going to do it? Excellent. I would like to see more hands later on. <laughs> or maybe, maybe the rest is not listening to me. <laughs> okay, let's, let's look at uh, some things. Find the differences of this and that. This is another puzzle I like to play. This, you've already seen. That is something else. <laughs> do you know what this one is? Probably not. Probably you can try to guess what that is. You can read it over there, but it's blurry enough that you're not going to read it, hopefully. You can apply algorithms to actually discover what that is, perhaps, with some uh, probability. There's something that's written over here, right? <laughs> or maybe your brain is so good enough to actually do that processing in comparison to all of the names in the world and figure out what this is. But, but I think, uh, I mean, I'm not going to go through what are the differences between this and that, but you can see that this is a regular if you will, a uh, train station that's not constructed with the same goals or same care or same idea and same trade-offs uh, that uh, Calatrava had in mind, clearly. And of course, it cost much less, I assume, than this one. Uh, so there are trade-offs, clearly, right? And uh, maybe there are some other trade-offs. There's more space here. You're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, uh, you're, you don't have to be as careful as you have to be in Stadelhofen. Although I'm sure there's some regulation that says it has to be this much space. But you can have more, right? Uh, so that's, a, that's the concept of margin, right? We use the concept of margin in computers also. Uh, you don't uh, clock your computer at the highest frequency possible, but you leave some margin. Instead of clocking it at 3 gigahertz, you clock it at 2.6 gigahertz because you think something may happen. You may not have tested it well. So you leave this margin. So these are very, uh, actually, these are engineering principles uh, that you will find in this course also. So clearly this margin, well, depending on how you look at where you should really stand, but assuming this is what you consider where you should stand behind, which you may not consider, but this is the margin, which is probably larger than this margin uh, over here, which means that the danger in this design is probably higher compared to the danger in this design. And later in this uh, talk, we're going to talk about faults. Computers have these faults also. You can get errors in memory. And part of that uh, may be because there was not enough margin. Uh, some people argue that some of the cell phones in the world burn because there was not enough margin in the case, between the case and the battery. Right? If that margin was large, then you would not get, uh, you, the, the thing would not burn, basically. So that's the concept of margin. Okay, so there are many trade-offs between the two designs. Of course, when you make trade-offs, uh, you need to have a basis to make trade-offs, and that's really the evaluation criteria for the design, right? And there could be many evaluation criteria. Uh, we will talk about that, hopefully, in the next lecture if we get to it. If not, we'll do it later in the course. But for, at least for the, these two different designs, I, I, I jotted down these. This is not meant to be a comprehensive list. Functionality, does it meet the specification? Does it work? Reliability, does it work reliably uh, for a given specification? Uh, space requirement, cost, can you expand it 
That's a, that could be a consideration in the design of a system, right? Can I expand this Bahnhof? Actually, the reason it was uh, rebuilt in 1983 was because they wanted to expand it, because the uh, train routes uh, in Zurich changed. If you look at uh, the history of those routes, they wanted to change the routes. As a result, they want to expand Stadelhofen. And I think there is still discussion on whether people want to expand Stadelhofen even more, right? I'm not sure if it can happen within that space, but people get creative, right? That's the beauty of uh, architecture and engineering. And there are other things, comfort level of users, right? If you care about that, that's important, right? And a lot of the success of something like this has come about because people really cared about that, right? Uh, happiness level, which may be different from comfort. Uh, aesthetics, uh, dot, 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 right? So I think my point is how to evaluate the goodness of design is always a critical question. And you've got to come up with some metrics to evaluate the goodness. Uh, and we will come up with metrics later in this course to evaluate the goodness of digital circuits, computer architectures. Uh, and you will see that it's not as easy uh, to do. Uh, there is no single metric to optimize for. Uh, and you usually trade off between different metrics. Okay. A key question, I'll ask this also so that to get you thinking a little bit. How was he able to design especially his key buildings? Stadelhofen is a good one, sure, but it's probably not his masterpiece yet. What about the other ones? What do you think? What went into it? I mean, this is a very open-ended question, of course, so I don't expect a single answer. But anybody want to venture a single guess? What's the most important thing? Yes? Inspiration. Inspiration, that's a good one, actually. Practice, that's good. Now, you, could, now there you, can, you can discuss which one is more important, right? Well, <laughs> maybe all of them are important. What else? Yes? That's good, yes. Out of the box thinking, which may be related to both. I don't know. May not be. Yes? Money, Money? that's good. <laughs> that's important, yeah. You've got to have some funding to be able to design, especially something like the Oculus. What else? Okay. Observation. Observation. Learning about the past, right? Maybe, or p maybe not past. Uh, well, I guess what exists is past or present, but observing what's happening in the outside world and applying it, right? Or maybe observing the past designs that people have made and saying, no, this is not good, right? I don't want this. That's also fine, right? That's how things improve. That critical thinking, uh, that critical way of looking at things. So yeah, you, you brought up many good points, some of which I cover over here, uh, some of which I don't. I'll put this, there's no, <laughs> uh, there's no ordering here. I just jotted that down. Basically hard work, perseverance, dedication over decades, experience, creativity, a good understanding of past designs or nature also, good judgment and intuition, strong skill com combination. If you look at his history, He's not only an architect, but he's also, also an engineer, also a sculptor, right? Uh, and funding, all of these. <laughs> and luck, probably. Luck actually affects things also. You will see that sometimes luck affects the designs that you make in the real world also as, as, as computer architects. Sometimes because you're too early in designing a very aggressive microprocessor, you, you just cannot sell it. You cannot find customers. If you are 10 years later, Maybe you will find a lot of customers. So that, that's part of the luck or timing. Uh, so there are a lot of things in the equation. And I think I will, I will uh, talk about these two uh, going forward in this lecture. But uh, there's no, uh, keep these in mind when, uh, when, when we talk about design uh, in this course. You will be exposed and hopefully develop and enhance many of these skills in this course. Uh, I'm not promising you any funding, sorry. <laughs> but uh, hopefully some of these other ones I can help you with, especially uh, the last two over here. And I think luck, I will have a comment later on. Uh, there, there's some very famous person who says, uh, luck or chance favors the prepared mind. So you can actually uh, turn the uh, dice toward yourself if, you can actually, if you're actually prepared with perhaps some of these ways. Okay. Okay, principle design. Let's take a look at it because I think this is really common across uh, many architects, but also computer architects as well. Uh, 
what is principle design? This is in Cloud Java's words. To me, there are two overriding principles to be found in nature which are most appropriate for building. One is the optimal use of material. The other, the capacity of organisms to change shape, to grow, and to move. And you can interpret it in different ways or ask him uh, what are the details. But clearly, he has principles in designing these things. Uh, and... Uh, I think this, I put this, uh, t took this from Wikipedia, but uh, Kalatrava's constructions are inspired by natural forms like plants, bird wings, and the human body. Actually, it's not Wikipedia. It's this ArcSpace uh, site. So this is one example and principle in action, right? Uh, can you guys see something here? Animals, humans, insects. A turtle, yeah, it could be a turtle also, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, that's the beauty of architecture, you can interpret it in different ways, <laughs> especially beautiful architecture. Well, what do these things look like? Like you can see a head, arms, legs. What if I superimpose something like this from his drawings? <laughs> it's really humans <laughs> or whatever animals, whatever imagination that you come up with that's really keeping this up, right? <laughs> So you start with the sketch, and it turns out into uh, this. <laughs> Actually, I don't. Uh, this is this is this is really interesting because this is exactly how computers get designed. Also, because you will start with sketches, maybe not exactly artistic as the, <laughs> in the in the way they are here, but they are going to be artistic in some way and form. Uh, and one one other example of this is uh, how many of you have been to the Sydney Opera House? I know it's far, so that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll introduce another principle in architecture because this is per probably the right time, and that's the principle of locality. Do you guys know the principle of locality? Locality means you access things. You, you basically, it's likely that you're going to access things that are close by to what you've accessed. Basically, the fact that you've been to Stadelhofen means that you're really exploiting the principle of locality, you're accessing things that are closer. Whereas Sydney Opera House, I saw only three hands. Right? It's far. It's not local, if you will. So a lot of the computer architectures today are designed to exploit locality. It's if you're going to access things, you put things together and access things that are around it a lot. Whereas you don't access things that are far away a lot. Okay, you can think of this as the principle of locality. And we'll see why this happens. Uh, but it's clearly, it happens because, uh, because of the proximity. And you will see that, I think, uh, well, I don't know if it'll happen with this class of the size, but, and maybe you'll prove me wrong now that I've, I'm going to say it. Most of the time, you will sit next to someone whom you've, sit, uh, whom you've sat next to before in the past. Or you're, go, you're, you're going to sit in the vicinity of where you've sat before. That's, again, the principle of locality. In computer architecture, we exploit principle of locality by using what's called caches. If a processor accesses a memory location, you bring it to a small piece of memory that's close to the processor that's much faster. And because the principle of locality holds, when the processor requires it the next time, that location next time, now it's in the cache. You get it very quickly. Instead of going all the way to the hard disk or memory to get that value again and again and again and again. Okay? That's a very fundamental principle. And all of the processors that we know of today are designed based on that principle. Okay. Uh, so Sydney Opera House, let me pull back. Uh, if, if, I, if I do this without moving, you should tell me Oh, you told us about the Sydney Opera House. What about it? Right. I was about to move to the next slide. Uh, so Sydney Opera House is also amazing. It's actually one of the most difficult buildings uh, that have been constructed, uh, uh, I believe, in the century. Uh, but it started out from a sketch like this. I wish I had it. Maybe I'll try to have it for the next lecture. And everybody said it's impossible to build. Uh, but it was built. And if you look at it, if you go there, you, you will enjoy it, I think. Okay, so a principle design. Basically, we're going to design based on principles. Uh, this was one of the principles of uh, Kalat Java. Uh, I guess 
people call zoomorphic architecture, but basically it's the practice of using animal forms as an inspirational base and blueprint for architectural design. And you can read the rest, uh, if you will. And you can see that uh, Calatrava's buildings are listed uh, as part of the zoomorphic architecture. So what does this remind you of? I guess I've already told about this, but it looks like a bird, right? Yeah, and in fact, uh, it was imagined as a bird, and if there were more money than $4 billion, this would be opening and closing also. <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, I guess the city of New York was not rich enough to pay for more than $4 billion. <laughs> okay, same puzzle, different example. I'll go through this relatively quickly, but I think... This will give us another example, uh, architect, if you will. Does anybody know this? Yes? Wow, you guys are amazing. How do you know it? Um, oh, what is it, first of all? Um, I, don't, it's, it's, uh, I don't remember what it's called, but the house was built in the wilderness, and the, the bridge is going right below it. Excellent. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> do, you know, do, you know, do you know its whereabouts? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know its whereabouts? No? Where is it? It's in the U.S. It's actually uh, from where I come from, from uh, very close to Carnegie Mellon University, close to Pittsburgh. Not exactly there. It's one and a half hours almost. It's called Falling Water, actually. If you wanted to cheat, you could have cheated. <laughs> but that's okay. It's good that you don't cheat. We don't want to cheat here. Uh, but it's a beautiful building, uh, and if you look at this, this is not only on top, of the, on top of waterfalls, but also it's really imitating the waterfall itself. If you look at the top cantilever over here, it looks like this. A bottom one looks like this, right? And there's more in the building. But it's really in harmony with the nature that's around it over here. It's an amazing building, I think. I've been there many times. And actually, when I, when I used to teach... Uh, a version of this course at Carnegie Mellon, I used to start with this building, uh, clearly because Americans don't know anything about anywhere else other than America, right? That's, uh, so, <laughs> especially going forward, it's going to be that way probably, <laughs> more. Uh, and this is another view of it. Uh, it's another beautiful view, I think. This is another view of it. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> so do you know who, who built this one? Okay. Silence. <laughs> oh, I see. Absolutely. Excellent. You get brownie points. <laughs> it's Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, he is uh, one of the most famous American architects. Uh, and basically, this is falling water. Uh, you, can, you can read about it. Basically, uh, it's, it's actually uh, cited as one of the most build beautiful buildings in the world, even though it's you could consider it almost in the middle of nowhere, right? <laughs> it is in the middle of nowhere if you're not close to Pittsburgh. Uh, and, uh, but uh, he was also a principled architect. We'll get to this. And I'll, I'll, I'll do the same game, if you want, same puzzle. You could, you could do this with many architects. We could do this for the rest of this course, and I'm not going to do it. But you could do it if you want. <laughs> so this is this, and this is that. <laughs> Now you can, you, can, you can apply the same thing to trade-offs, right? Clearly, this is more costly again. And again, this is one of those buildings where the architect didn't uh, ask for some amount of money, but they figured out that they cannot complete what they envisioned with that amount of money, so they asked for more, and then they asked for more. <laughs> and this was funded by a family. It's the Kaufman residence, actually. I don't know if it's somewhere here. Uh, the Kaufman family. It's not here. Oh, there you go, Kaufman residence. Uh, that family funded it. And eventually they said, no, we were not going to pay for more. Let's, let's get it done. We want to live here. <laughs> it's similar to the Oculus, Oculus, actually. The wings are not uh, moving up and down because they said, no, we're not going to pay for more. Okay, but this, clearly this is not a bad house. It's okay. Uh, maybe I don't mind living there if, if I like the surrounding area, but I prefer living here probably. <laughs> Although this depends on your choice again, right? So clearly there is a space for different types of buildings or architectures also, right? Sometimes you want a very powerful computer, but you cannot carry it with you to do climate simulations 
Maybe nobody can carry it with them, right? Uh, but sometimes you don't want a powerful computer. You just want a good enough computer that you can carry with you, right? So it's good to think about. And sometimes you want a really cheap computer, like less than, less than one Swiss franc, so that you can do something really, really simple and stupid with it, but it would be useful for you, right? So clearly there are benefits to different buildings also. That's not to say that this building is useless. There is a space. And we will see that a lot in this course also. You have all types of computers. You have all types of processors, right? Some processors are extremely fast. Some processors are extremely slow. Some processors use sophisticated techniques like out-of-order execution to get high performance. They basically execute the instructions in the program out of the order the programmer specified them so that they get much more parallelism out of it as a result, much more performance. As a result, they are more expensive. They occupy more area, and they consume more power. Some other processors are very simple. They execute everything in order. They actually ha can execute only one instruction at a given time. No more than one instruction can be present in the pipeline. And we'll talk about pipeline also. But if you can think of it as an assembly line, yeah, you get the instructions. So that's a much cheaper processor. And there may be benefit to that processor, right? If all you do it doesn't have parallelism, then you'd want that simple processor, perhaps, right? It's cheap, it's energy efficient, and it gets the job done. So that's the conce concept of having different kinds of types of architectures for different purposes. And now you can say, oh, I want all kinds of jobs. I, I have a job that has both characteristics, right? That's good for out of order. Uh, that we want, I want high performance there, and I am, I'm fine with paying more energy. And I have parts of my program that are really simple. I don't need out-of-order execution. And when I'm executing parts of my program that are really simple, I want this processor to be there. And when I want really high performance, I want this processor to be there. So why don't we put the two processors together, a large processor and a small processor, and design the upper layer such that it orchestrates the movement of the program between those two so you get the best of both worlds. And that's the concept of heterogeneity. Basically, you have a heterogeneous system that consists of multiple different types of processors, and you manage it to get the best of those processors. Of course, clearly, this adds more cost and also management complexity. So there's a trade-off here that you're making. Instead of a single type of design, you want some heterogeneous uh, design. You may see that in the buildings also, actually. But this exists, for example, uh, ARM's big little architecture is an example of this. At least in the first incarnation, uh, I believe they had one big core and four small cores. And they're able to move the program that's executing from the big core to the small cores when they're, let's say, uh, running out of battery, if you will. It depends on the operating system, of course, to figure out how to manage this big little system. And we will see later that we may, uh, we may have heterogeneous memory systems. One type of memory may not be good enough for everything. We may want some other types of memory next to it also. OK, uh, let me get back over here uh, from the examples. You can list, many, you can list these uh, trade-offs later on also, but you don't have to do them. Stadelhofen is good enough if you do it. So I'll do the same thing. You can have many guesses as to how Wright was able to design his masterpiece. In this case, this is his masterpiece. It's considered that way. Clearly, the principal design is one of it. Uh, and I'll give you another example. So the, all of these architects had uh, principles. Uh, Wright's principle was a little bit different. Basically, he was not a proponent of doing uh, business as usual, basically. And he had very strong views on this. Uh, uh, you don't want to base your architecture upon precedent. Maybe you, you don't want to be influenced too much by precedent. You want to learn from the precedent, but you want to base your architecture on your principles. Uh, and that's how he was able to come up with it. So this is a precedent. This is a more principled design, at least for him. So what's his principle? In this case, it's an organic architecture. It's basically a philosophy of architecture which promotes harmony between human, human habitation and the natural world through design approaches so sympathetic and well-integrated with its site uh, that buildings, furnishings, and surroundings become part of a unified interrelated composition. Well, that's a mouthful of words. But it's, it's, it's very, uh, all of this is very present in the falling water picture uh, that uh, we've seen. Okay. Any questions so far? Anybody bored of this? Saying we should move on? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> okay, we will move on. Don't worry. <laughs> We're almost there. 
Okay. Uh, so, uh, the principle design, we talk about it. But also, there's a strong understanding and commit of and commitment to fundamentals, which is also going to be a hallmark of this course. Uh, so, this, this clearly did not come about uh, Im immediately, right? You started with this, and then it somehow turned into this. And then later on, when Kalat um, Rava took it, you start with basic building blocks, right? Clearly, these basic building blocks is not something magic. In the end, what may end up uh, may look like a magic, magic like Oculus, right? But you start with wood, right? You start with steel. You start with basic materials, and you start with methods of connecting them. Just like we will start in this lecture with transistors, logic on top of that, uh, devices, well, devices on top of that, and then logic on top of that. And you'll learn how to construct architectures that way. Of course, there's other things that go into this, like civil engineering, but we're not, we're not here for the uh, real architecture course. But clearly, these things got constructed from some basic building blocks. And you really need to know those basic building blocks to do something really creative. And the end result is this, basically. So takeaways. Basically, it all starts from the basic building blocks uh, and the design principles. And the goal of this course is to teach you that in digital logic. Uh, and knowledge of how to use and apply them. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, actually, that's why we have labs in this course that are really important. Uh, I know you're not here for grades, hopefully not. But 25% of the grade will be determined based on labs. Uh, and you will figure out how to use them and apply them in those labs. So I will definitely encourage you to attend those labs. And underlying technology might change. You might do it with steel, wood, uh, or something, whatever. Uh, in, in computer architecture, you might do it with different types of devices, right? It doesn't have to be uh, CMOS devices that we have. It might be quantum devices. It might be some other devices that may come, phase change devices, which we may talk about later in the course. That may change, but the methods of taking advantage of technology bears resemblance. Those principles do not really change. Methods used for design depend on the principles uh, uh, employed, and you will see that uh, in this course. So let's look at some, uh, some computer architecture now. Uh, basically, the same thing applies to processor chips. Basically, there are basic building blocks and design principles. Whatever you design over here, and these are actually very different processors. It's a multi-core processor. This is Intel's multi-core. IBM's heterogeneous uh, processor. IBM's multi-core. Uh, Intel single-chip cloud computing. Uh, NVIDIA's GPU. Some other multi-core. And some other multi-core. Basically, the design principles, the basic building blocks are the same. You start with digital logic in the end, and we'll take a look at that. And again, it's the same over here, it's the same over here. And you can, th so you can see this, this is a beautiful architecture, right? This is one of the, I think, Verizon's data centers. Uh, okay, so basic building blocks, clearly Electron is one basic building block, and we will talk about the transformation hierarchy in a little bit, but we cannot manipulate electrons, unfortunately, right? We cannot take one electron and put it next to the other one and make it move, right? That's not how we do, so we create abstraction layers on top of this. We build a transistor that can actually work with the electrons, if you will, basic, basic principles of electrons, logic gates on top of those transistors, uh, and on top of those combinational and sequential logic circuits uh, and storage elements and memory. And on top of that, cores, caches, interconnects, and memories, and on top of that, computers. Right? It's really uh, a very principled way of building things. So I'll give you your first... Other assignment, if you will. Stadelhofen is good, but it won't teach you anything about computer architecture other than thinking about things and imagining how it applies. Uh, so these are your first reading assignments. This is for this week. Uh, we have two books. You can do either one. If you do both, you will learn more. Uh, this is the required one. So if you do this one, that's good. It's chapter one in Harris and Harris, and chapter one, chapters one and two in Pat and Patel, basically. How many of you have the first one? You can actually get the PDF. Uh, okay, great. Probably not many of you have the second one, but we have it in the library, and we may actually put the PDFs uh, in a secure place. And the third reading assignment is the supplementary lecture slides uh, on binary numbers. We're not going to cover binary numbers in this incarnation of this course. You've probably seen binary numbers, right? How many of you know? Yes? Who has known binary numbers? Okay, excellent. Yeah. But if you want to brush up, you can, we will put lecture slides on binary numbers, like how to do arithmetic on binary numbers. Should be a piece of cake for everyone here. You're a Teha student, so. The bar is high. 
Okay, so let me give you a little bit more about this course, and we'll take a, a short break, and then we'll continue after that. Uh, so these are the major high-level goals as I see them. Basically, we're going to focus on digital circuit design and computer architecture, uh, and we will see how these things fit together in a little bit. But we'd like to understand the basics. That's the goal. The first goal is to really understand the basics, the principles of design, and some precedents also, like how people design things. Actually, you're going to build, at the end of this course, you're going to have a design implemented on an FPGA that's based on a precedent, basically. Someone designed this for you, basically, and you're going to implement it. And that will go, that's going to be very instructive because you're going to go all the way into the details of the design and make it work. And based on such understanding, you, uh, we uh, will learn how a modern computer works underneath. We'll learn how to evaluate trade-offs of different designs and ideas, hopefully, and I think this is really critical for engineering. Uh, and we'll uh, learn, uh, implement a principal design, a simple microprocessor, as I mentioned. It's not going to be a full microprocessor because that'll, that's going to be a ta take a long time. It's going to be a subset of an ISA, instruction set architecture, that's used today. And you will learn to systematically debug increasingly complex systems. That's going to be important because a lot of what, what you will do in this course will be debugging your designs. <laughs> Sorry for the news, but that's exactly how things work. Uh, in computer science and engineering, all of the fields. It's not only about designing and then implementing. Actually, it's really about debugging. If you look at a company like Intel, when they design uh, a processor, the latest processor, it doesn't matter which processor, actually the latest one has a higher number, what fraction of the cost of that processor actually goes into test and verification and debug, you think? Can anybody venture a guess? 30, I heard. 70? 70. 80. 80. Okay, increasing. That's like an auction now. <laughs> so I don't know the exact number, and uh, I don't think Intel wants to disclose those exact numbers, but it's clearly more than 50% at this point in time. It used to be 40% at some point, but it's increasing, basically. The time spent on testing and verification and debugging is increasing. And there are many t uh, you, you do this testing during design, during implementation, and after the processor is actually out, the first thing that is done in a silicon lab is post-silicon debug, right? You basically take the silicon and make sure it works, or check if it works. That's the post-silicon debug process. And if you actually put things into your design that makes the process easier, you pay less cost, perhaps, on that post-silicon debug, right? Okay. And hopefully, uh, in the end, this course will enable you to develop novel out-of-the-box designs. That's not a requirement of this course, because it's a very introductory course, but hopefully in the chain of events, it will enable you to develop those designs. So our focus is on basics, principles, precedents, and how to use them to create and implement good designs. So let me cover this slide, and then uh, I'll, uh, I'll take a break for five minutes, and then we'll go continue. So why do we want these goals? <laughs> well clearly, because you're here for a computer science degree. And I believe every computer science, I believe every computer scientist needs to know this stuff. Uh, but I think there is something more to it. Regardless of your future direction, I think learning the principles of digital design and computer architecture will be useful to design better hardware, clearly, but also design better software. And I'll give you some examples of this, because understanding what goes on underneath really enables you to design the upper layers in a much more cognizant way. Design better systems in general, because you know this stuff well. Make better trade-offs in design. We'll talk a lot about trade-offs. Understand why computers behave they do. Well, this is a very high bar. <laughs> I, don't clearly, I don't actually understand why computers, why this computer slows down, for example. If you actually solve that problem, I think you can be extremely rich, if that's your goal in life. Uh, if you figure out a way of automatically uh, telling the person or telling someone this is the exact reason why this computer slowed down. I'm going to fix it automatically for you and make it work. That sounds like a great startup idea. If you have ideas, come to me. <laughs> I'll, I'll fund your uh, initial thing <laughs> if you have a good idea. <laughs> okay, solve problems better. Uh, I think that's one of the most important things. We're going to solve problems here. The goal of computing is to solve problems. So we're, we're going to see how those problems get solved underneath at the very, very low levels. Think in parallel. I think this is really important, actually. Uh, when, when industry transitioned from single-core, single-processor designs to multi-processor designs, one of the big issues was 
oh, people don't know how to write software in parallel. And that's most of the time true, probably. Uh, but hardware, if you think of it, it is inherently parallel. So you're, you're going to design a circuit at the end of the course and during the course. You're going to see that there will be signals that are moving data concurrently. You have to reason about them. You're not going to be able to say, oh, this signal goes first, this signal goes next, and then this signal goes next, and then this signal goes next. No. Those signals will operate in parallel at the same time. And you're going to get used to thinking in parallel. That's why having this information, this, this knowledge, and doing this course will help you think in parallel and hopefully maybe write better, more parallel software as well. And think critically. I think uh, we have the critical thinking initiative at ETH, which is, I think, really beautiful. Uh, all of you should be thinking critically on, about everything, if you will. That's how, that's how we can make uh, the world better. Even though politicians in some part of the world may not like thinking critically. That's, you guys are different. Okay. Okay, good. This is a good place to stop. Let's take a break for uh, five to six minutes. No? You want 10? Okay. 15. <laughs> 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Come back at 14.15. Uh, <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? How about now? No? Not working? Okay, let's get started. These bells are nice because now uh, hopefully they can stop me from overrunning the margins. <laughs> I like operating at the margin. So, <laughs> well, I don't know if you can close this, but maybe not. That's okay. As long as you can hear me, that's okay. Okay. Uh, so hopefully that has given you... Thank you. Uh, an idea of what we're going to cover. But let's start with why do we have computers. Can anybody have a guess? Like, why do we have all these computers? Entertainment. Okay, excellent. What else? To get things done for us. That's good. That's good. Calculations. To get things messy. Okay. <laughs> Netflix? <laughs> sure, yes. <laughs> Anybody else? No? There's this light, so I cannot see this. There, there's a blind spot here that I cannot see. So if you're over there, then <laughs> tough luck. You'll have to shout. Uh, okay, this is, this is a good start. <laughs> I will argue that, except for to get things messy... But even that, perhaps, I could fit into the, the reason that I have over here. Uh, basically this, <laughs> to solve problems, right? Entertainment is a problem. If you want to create mess, you have a problem, and the computers can solve it for you, right? <laughs> basically, computers are created to solve problems, right? So how do computers solve the problems? Well, I guess there's, there's a huge variety of answers here, so I'm going to give you my answer by orchestrating electrons. In the end, they really, that's what they do, right? In the end, they orchestrate the principles of physics to solve the problems. Yet there's a huge gap between problems and electrons, right? You cannot, as a human, say, electrons, please do this for me, right? If they hear you, which is a challenge, how will they respond to you, right? It's not clear. So you clearly don't have a way of directly talking to electrons. So... There is a way, and that's through the levels of transformation. But I'll introduce it uh, with this. So this is a beautiful quote by Richard Hamming. Uh, he said, the purpose of computing is to gain insight, which is, I think, a really good way of thinking about it uh, on problems, maybe. Uh, do you know about Richard Hamming? Do I know? Hamming, I heard Hamming distance. Good. Where did you hear about Hamming distance? Discrete mathematics, last semester? Okay, excellent. So I can ask you questions about Hamming distance and you'll tell me everything. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, okay, that's him with his cat. Uh, now we can forget about him for a while. Not fully. But we gain and generate insight by solving problems in the end, right? That's how we gain insight into things. Uh, the question is, how do we ensure problems are solved by electrons? That's what I mentioned earlier. Basically, we start with this problem specification at the high level. And we want to make sure the electron does what we want and solve the problem. As I said, we cannot directly speak to this guy over here or girl over here who's moving too fast probably for us. So we transform the problem into an algorithm. Right? So this is the levels of transformation we're going to go through. And all of computing is built on top of this levels of transformation, although there are some differences at the middle layers, if you will. We will talk about that very briefly today, but you will get to see that when you actually put your designs as well. So I've already given you what an algorithm is. It's really a step-by-step -step procedure that is guaranteed to terminate. That's one important part, where each step is precisely defined and can be carried out by a computer. So finiteness is, a, uh, is basically, uh, so you, you have definiteness, precise definition. Finiteness can be carried out by a computer and effective, or, or the other way. Finite, sorry. Finiteness you can terminate. Definiteness, you can press, uh, each step is precisely or definitely stated. And effective computability is effectively computable by a computer. You can have a human algorithm that needs to be effectively computable by a human, right? <laughs> You can think of humans as computers also. Actually, there's a field out there that thinks about neuromorphic computing, if you will, that's essentially trying to use the principles of uh, uh, human brain to design computers, right? Can we somehow do that? We're not going to talk about that in this course. That's more advanced. But if you have interest in that, you can search for it and you can look at it. But you need to know what an algorithm is. Basically, if, we, if I throw at you an algorithm, or something that looks like an algorithm, you can tell me whether or not it really is an algorithm, right? Uh, so, for example, if you give me an algorithm where I have to jump over this building uh, to get to Zurich, then that won't work for me because that's not computable by me, right? Sorry, I cannot do that. Uh, similarly, you need effective computability uh, for uh, what a computer can compute. We will... We may talk about what a computer can compute later. That's, that's really going into the theory of computation. But that's really not exactly the topic of this course. OK, then you take the algorithm, transform it to a language that enables the computer to understand this algorithm. Human languages don't have this property. Although computers are getting really good at understanding human languages, they're still not as good, right? Uh, Actually, one of the uh, important tests uh, in computing, uh, computing is uh, you, you put uh, the human next to the computer, but the human doesn't know that uh, he, he or she is speaking to the computer. Can, the com can actually uh, the computer fuel, fool the human that it is a human, right? That hasn't been <laughs> done yet, unfortunately. If you can do it, again, you can probably be rich. Okay, but uh, the natural language that we use is not appropriate for computers because we use a lot of ambiguity in language. Uh, and that's actually problematic for computers because they don't like ambiguity in general. Although the field is changing quite a bit, so keep this in mind, there's a lot of machine learning that's happening today that could potentially change that, maybe not in the design of the hardware itself, but uh, think about it. Okay. Uh, so you need to translate to a program language, and many of you pro have programmed uh, with different languages, I assume. What's your favorite language? What? Java? C? C++? Yes. <laughs> oh, C, okay, good. <laughs> C Sharp. There are many of these, right? They're developed for many different purposes, and when you take the languages course, you'll understand why they're there. But that gets translated, or that gets run on top of a runtime system, the operating system, virtual machine, memory manager, that does all of these tasks for the program to run on a computer. So this thing exists in many computers today. Not all computers. I mean, if you actually directly uh, put a program into hardware, that doesn't exist. But we're talking about general purpose computers over here. Uh, so the job of the OS, operating system, virtual machine, or memory manager is to do resource management, underlying, manage the hard, underlying hardware resources. And the program gets compiled into uh, ISA, what's called ISA, instruction set architecture. 
How many of you have heard of this term, ISA? Okay, good. Good, you're learning something. ISA. Uh, or ISA. This is called Instruction Set Architecture. Basically, we'll talk about it later again, but it's really the interface or contract between the software and the hardware. This specifies what's an instruction, for example, an add instruction. How, how is it encoded? And what, should the, what will the hardware do when it receives an add instruction? That's part of the ISA. What will the hardware do when it receives a load instruction from memory? What will it do when it receives a multiply instruction? Okay? And there is always uh, the question of what are the right instructions to put into architecture. We're not going to deal with that a lot in this course. Later, if you take a more advanced computer architecture course, we're going to talk about trade-offs. Like, what should be the granularity of an instruction? Should it be at the granularity of an ad? Or should it be at the granularity of, I don't know, encode this video for me with these inputs, right? That's, that could be an instruction, right? Assuming you specify it well, and if you define the contract between the software and the hardware precisely. But basically, this is what the programmer assumes the hardware will deliver. Hardware promises, and the programmer assumes that, and assuming, and then that interface specifies how that's communicated. And this is critical. That's part of the layer that we're going to talk about. There are many different ISAs in the world. x86 is one of them. That's probably used in many computers, many machines that you have. That's Intel's uh, and AMD's ISA. I guess it's called IA64, uh, IA32 uh, sometimes by Intel, I, in, Intel architecture. But IA64 was another ISA that Intel developed to go to 64 bits in terms of their uh, operands. But that didn't work out too well for Intel. We're not going to go into the details of why not. But uh, ARM is another ISA. Uh, a lot of embedded systems use that ISA. But these are basically interface specifications between the software and the hardware. Uh, a good way of thinking about the ISA is uh, what should the, uh, this is essentially what should a programmer need to know, programmer meaning the low-level programmer, to actually write programs on top of a computer. So underneath, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this more. Uh, underneath ISA, there's another level that's really the microarchitecture. So this is what the programmer doesn't get exposed to, but this is how the ISA, the instructions are actually implemented by the hardware. These are basically building blocks. Controller, for example. It's really an, an implementation of the ISA. For example, Intel's x86 ISA has many implementations. Uh, Pentium 4 is one of them. How many of you know about Pentium 4? It's probably too old for you. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are young. <laughs> Intel Core architecture, right? Core i7, for example, is another example uh, of an implementation of the ISA. They all implement the x86 uh, ISA, but they're all different organizations underneath. Uh, for example, Intel had the uh, uh, Pentium uh, a long time ago. That was the first Pentium. And it was actually uh, an in-order processor. Internally, the microarchitecture was in-order, meaning it executes, executed the instructions in the order the programmer specified them. As a result, it was lower performance. But later, Intel moved to the Pentium 3, Pentium Pro architecture, which is really the predecessor of a lot of the core architectures, they actually did uh, incorporate out-of-order execution into it. So that's a clearly a different implementation. You can execute instructions in the order the programmer specifies them, and as a result, probably have lower performance. Or you can execute instructions in the hardware in, the, in a different order. You can say, oh, this instruction I can execute earlier, even though it comes at a later time or later, order, uh, later place in the program. But I can say that if I execute it right now, it's OK because other instructions don't depend on it, right? Or because I don't need the inputs of other instructions to execute it, right? So if you can do that, that's a much faster processor, but that's a different implementation. So this is a clear example of uh, how the same uh, program, can, uh, how, same ISA can be implemented underneath. Another uh, example is how do you implement the add instruction, right? Even some, something as simple as that, uh, is interesting. And you'll implement adders in this course. I'll foreshadow a little bit. You can have an adder uh, that's really slow, that adds bit by bit. Every cycle, every clock cycle, we'll talk about that also, you add one bit. So if you want to add 32 bits, you wait for 32 cycles. It's small, but it's cheap, right? Uh, it's, it's small and cheap, but it's slow, right? That's the trade-off. Or you can, add a, you can design a humongous adder that basically adds many, many bits at the same time, 32 bits in parallel, right? 
more costly, but faster. Right? These are two different implementations of the same ad instruction. Right? That's part of the microarchitecture. It's really the implementation. How, do you, how does the hardware uh, implement things to satisfy the contract? Because hardware doesn't need to do it exactly the way uh, it's specified or the programmer thinks it may happen uh, as long as it satisfies the contract, as long as it delivers what it's supposed to deliver to the programmer. There's no problem, right? This out-of-order execution is fascinating, for example, because the programmer thinks that things are executed in order, but actually they're executed out of order. Now, of course, there's a contract in many ISAs saying that you can execute things, uh, saying that the results that are exposed to the programmer eventually have to be in order. So if I'm actually debugging this program, I have to see that things happen in order. Right? So the microarchitecture needs to uh, the, uh, uh, micro, uh, obey that contract in the end. And how we do that, we'll see that later in the course. It may sound like magic right now, but that's one of the fascinating things about architecture uh, design. And many systems today are actually out-of-order processors. Uh, this is uh, uh, most high-performance designs. Of course, they're more costly and high, uh, higher performance at the same time. So this is out-of-order processors, for example. Uh, okay. So underneath, there's a logic layer. Basically, these are digital logic circuits. These are the building blocks of microarchitecture. For example, gates, logic gates. To build an adder, you need to use gates to build that adder. So this is another level of abstraction, a lower level uh, than microarchitecture. And we will start, actually, uh, around that level soon. You'll see more examples of this. And underneath, there are devices, basically, which we will not that, talk about that much. Uh, but we will, uh, if, you, if you read your, uh, do your reading, which is required, you'll see that there are different types of devices, CMOS devices, NMOS devices, and PMOS devices. How many of you know about this? Okay, some of you do, but some of you don't. But you will need to do your reading to actually know it, and we will uh, get to it starting from next week. Uh, I don't want to dedicate this lecture and make it the entire course. <laughs> supposed to be introduction. So this is what we're going to cover in this course, basically. We're going to start very little with devices, if you will. We're not going to go down into it. If you want to learn more about it, you should go to the ITIT department and uh, take device courses. Uh, those are also fascinating. Uh, but we will mainly start with the transistor uh, as a light switch, as uh, basically the abstraction level on which all of the, everything else is built upon. Uh, and then we'll talk about microarchitecture, ISA, and uh, I put a little bit more from the blue part because I think that blue part is especially important. You really need to know the interaction between the software and the hardware. Uh, so we're going to uh, touch upon uh, the runtime system, the operating system, a little bit later on. But an aside, I guess I have to do this. Uh, Richard Hamming had a lot of impact, uh, other than his picture in the previous slide, uh, on computing. And this is actually the uh, work where he introduced uh, the error correcting codes, ECC, uh, and where he introduced really the Hamming, concept of Hamming distance. So since you know Hamming distance, I'm not going to cover it. How many of you know Hamming distance again? Oh, excellent. There. there you go. Basically, you can tell me this definition, but I'm not going to bore you with it. <laughs> Basically, it's really the number of locations uh, in which the corresponding symbols of two equal length strings are different. Right? And this turns out this is really useful in error correction, right? because you can actually have Hamming codes. And he developed a theory of codes used for error detection and correction. We may get to error correction later tomorrow, very little, uh, just as an introduction of something. But I would also recommend, he, he has a lot of uh, inspirational talks on how to do research, how to uh, actually... Uh, have the right mindset to do research. If you're interested in that direction, I would definitely recommend his lecture that he delivered at Bell Labs uh, in 1986. He did a lot of his research at Bell Labs. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll give you another view. So critical thinking is important, as I said. Uh, like, uh, maybe I'm not as smart as you guys. Uh, when I first saw that uh, transformation hierarchy, it was good to me. But over time... I thought, oh, maybe there's more into this transformation hierarchy. So this transformation hierarchy is actually different from what you would see from you in your book or in any of the books. Uh, it's basically on my slides. You're not going to find this anywhere else unless they copied my slides or unless they had the same kind of thinking, perhaps. Uh, but I think there's another way of looking at the transformation hierarchy, and I think that's increasingly important. So I'd like you guys to think about these things uh, in this lecture uh, or in this course. And it's really the user-centric view of the transformation hierarchy, right? And today, especially uh, more than ever, uh, we need to think about as computer designers, 
regardless of whether or not you design software or hardware, right? How does the user uh, view this hierarchy? Yeah, that's not aligned. I'll fix that. But basically, perhaps the entire stack should be optimized for the user, right? This is not something we do a lot today. And if you do it well, like some people have done, this actually is good, right? It's good for the user. Of course, the question is, who is the user? It always comes about. But I think think about it uh, when, you, uh, when you actually, the user can be the programmer, the user can be the problem definer, algorithm definer, or user can be interacting with the system. And sometimes the user, the hardware designer, actually, I should, I should actually change it, right? See, I'm thinking critically right now. Probably the user may interact with the ISA just like you guys, because you guys will be doing that, the assembly programmer and microarchitecture and the logic and the circuits. Okay. So uh, there are implications of this also in programming languages. How do you design the programming language to input uh, what the user wants? Right? For example, if can the user pro uh, ask for a quality of service from a program? Uh, how do you design the operating system such that the user actually can convey their input while it's running? Today, I think the operating systems don't have that kind of view as much. Clearly, there are interfaces, but maybe we're not able to communicate with them well our intentions on what we, what we would like to do in computing. Okay. So all of this uh, takes us to the power of abstraction. Really, we're doing this to abstract away things, if you will. So this, these levels of transformation create abstractions. What is an abstraction? Basically, a higher level needs to know only about the interface to the lower level and not anything about what's happening underneath. ISA is a perfect example of this, right? Uh, the higher level, above ISA, when you write programs, uh, assembly programs, let's say, you don't need to know anything about underneath. Now, I'll qualify that later. But you, for, for a functional program, you don't need to know anything uh, about what goes on underneath. Microarchitecture, you don't care. Right? It just works, hopefully. Uh, yeah, for example, the high level, even at the higher level, the high level language programmer does not really need to know what the ISA is even, right? If you write in Java... Why do you care what the ISA is, as long as you want a functional program, right? And how a computer executes instructions. You probably care about that less if you write in Java or JavaScript, right? So abstraction is great because it improves productivity, right? Otherwise, you would go crazy. If everybody in the world needed to know about how to communicate with the electrons, good luck, right? We're not going to be productive at all. Uh, you don't need to worry about the decisions made in the underlying levels. Right? That's good because some, it's somebody else's problem. Yeah, for, for example, programming in Java versus C versus assembly versus binary versus by specifying control signals of each transistor every cycle. You probably are better off programming in Java as opposed to by specifying control signals of each transistor every cycle, right? There are not many people in the world that can do that. Uh, so then, why do we want to know what goes on underneath or above? Like, why, why do we have this course other than the fact that it's in the CS curriculum? Uh, why we think it's important. Well, uh, you would like to cross the abstraction layers in some cases. So as long as nothing go, everything goes well, not knowing what happens underneath or above is not a problem, actually. Unless you want to have an optimization goal that actually you really want, you don't want just functionality, but extremely high performance. Then you need to know what's going on, actually. And actually, you could consider as, uh, as, uh, that as a problem, everything, something not going well. Basically, you write a program, it's functional, it's great, it works, you get the right answer, but it runs like a dog. It's extremely slow, right? Then, that's a problem. Now, how do, you figure, how do you fix that problem? You need to know what goes on underneath. Like, why is this program misbehaving? Maybe you will figure out that when you're, when you're running this program, you're not using your cache efficiently, right? You didn't write this program such that it fits into your memory. But now you need to know how does that, that the fact that memory exists, how big it is, how you need to lay out the data such that it fits that memory, it fits the cache. That's exactly why you need to know the underneath. But also there are other cases. Well, I gave you one example. What if the program you wrote is running slow? It doesn't run correctly. How do you debug it? Knowing underneath helps a lot, actually. The program you wrote consumes too much energy. Oh, good luck, right? Now you need to measure the energy somehow and figure out how to do that also, right? Your system just shut down and you have no idea why. <laughs> This happens to me a lot, right? <laughs> and someone just compromised your system and you have no idea how or why. And I'll give you an example of this actually later. Uh, probably not today, since we're going to run out of time. But tomorrow, 
But by the way, this, this, this lecture is supposed to be two lectures. I designed it that way. So we're not going to cover all of the slides for today. Okay. And on the other hand, what if the hardware you designed is too hard to program? So this cuts across both ways. It's not just uh, the software always has problems. It's also sometimes the hardware has problems. What if it's too hard to program? And we've seen that in many, many cases. This is a place where knowing the precedent helps a lot. For example, the IBM cell processor. I want to pick on cell. Even though we're being recorded, that's okay. <laughs> Basically, IBM cell processor that I showed in one of the previous slides was a monster to program. Nobody could program it, as far as I know, who, would, uh, who, who was not an expert in the cell architecture, basically. And uh, that's a problem. Then you need to know how to fix it, right? And we'll talk about perhaps, uh, actually, I will, I will talk briefly about why it was hard to program. In my opinion, one of the reasons that was, that, uh, why it was hard to program was because there, it, there was no coherence. So cell had this uh, large processor, that was supposed to do operating system tasks and, or uh, system tasks or task distribution. And then these smaller processors. Uh, but these smaller processors did not have something called coherence. Remember, I told you about two computers modifying the same data and making sure that it's consistent. Coherence is a mechanism that's designed in microarchitecture and hardware that makes sure that if this processor modifies this data element at at this location, this other processor won't get the old value. They will get the correct value. Now, if the hardware provides that seamlessly, saying, okay, in the microarchitecture, I'm going to provide you that, such that the programmer doesn't need to worry about it, that makes life a lot easier for the programmer. Because now the programmer doesn't need to know, doesn't need to worry about, oh, if I manipulate this data over here in this processor, it should really not be manipulated over here also. Right? That's a nightmare for the programmer which cell had. Whereas if the hardware does that, the programmer can say, I'm going to manipulate the data however I want, and the hardware will magically enable that data to be seen by the other processor. That's the idea of cache coherence or data coherence in general. We'll talk about that later in the course. But that's one clear example of a hard-to-program hardware not having cache coherence. Uh, but that's another place where if, if you're programming the hardware and if you see these errors where oh, you're manipulating this data over here, but you're getting some wrong results. Knowing how the cache coherence protocol may work would be useful, or how the model uh, works uh, would be useful. What if the hardware you designed is too slow because it doesn't provide the right primitives to the software? That's another thing, right? That's, it's actually getting harder right now. And again, this is, what if you want to design a much more efficient and higher performance system? Uh, clearly not knowing, knowing only one part of the system, one part of the stack will not work in this case. So if you're designing a supercomputer, for example, uh, here there's, there's a big initiative for the Swiss uh, National Supercomputing Center, right? Uh, you may go and visit them. But they're not clearly saying, oh, we're designing high-performance software. They're designing high-performance stacks because there's no way they're going to just focus on the software level and get an extremely efficient and high-performance system. Okay, so crossing the abstraction layers. I, so I would like to leave the last uh, five or six minutes to Daryuan, who just arrived. You need just five or six minutes, right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So you, you guys asked me some uh, questions about the labs. So he will tell you a little bit more about the labs. So make me stop six minutes before. <laughs> okay. So you will learn all about the labs, don't worry. <laughs> Okay, crossing the abstraction layers. There are two goals of this course in this, uh, especially toward the second half. Although I think in the first two lectures, I want to get you in this mindset because more than anything else, I believe uh, this crossing of the abstraction layers is about the mindset that you put yourself into. If you start with the mindset saying, so a lot of people start with the mindset, I want to be a software engineer or I want to be a hardware engineer. I don't like that mindset and I wouldn't recommend that you go that way. It's better to have the mindset, I want to know both as much as possible such that I can cross the abstraction layers because you don't really know when you need one or the other. In fact, it's much better if you can cooperate between the two. So there are two goals of this course. Uh, one is to understand how a processor works underneath the software layer and how decisions made in hardware affect the software and programmers. So these are two things. Uh, and the second is to enable you to be comfortable in making design and optimization decisions that cross the boundaries of different layers and system components. Now, we won't be able to do it perfectly in an introductory course. 
So to be able to do this really, really well, you need to take, a, uh, take the next course uh, from me in the computer architecture. But we will sprinkle in some things that will enable you to think about this. Okay, let me, uh, I guess we have time for one mystery, if you will. <laughs> because some things may look mysterious if you don't know what's going on underneath. And I'll give you some examples of this uh, from my experience. Uh, and I think these are interesting and good examples. But let's see if we, if, I, if we really have time to do that. Okay, who wants me to do that or who wants me to stop? Do it. Well, it's hard to, we need a clicker. Who, who wants me to stop? Stop, I've had enough of you. You can tell me. No, I, I, this is not going to affect your grade. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I'm not going to look. Maybe you're going to look and count. <laughs> do you want to do that? Look and count. So who wants me to stop? I'm not looking. <laughs> yeah? You counted? One. Okay. I'm not going to ask who that is. Okay. <laughs> So I'm assuming you're honest. You can tell me, actually, if you want me to stop, and I won't be offended. Don't worry. I can, I can talk for hours and hours. That's not a problem with me. I can understand that it could be a problem with you. As a result, please tell me when it's too much. So I'm taking, you that, I'm taking that you're honest in what you tell me right now, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> continue. Okay, I'll continue. So I'll give you one example, mystery. We're going to do two more. Uh, I, don't, I want to do justice to this, uh, because... Uh, so. Okay, we have time. That's good. Uh, eight minutes. <laughs> Not bad. So this is a multi-core chip, uh, and we're going to cover a lot of it, actually, in this lecture. Basically, it has these cores. It has some caches that we briefly talked about. This is AMD Barcelona, actually. It's a really old chip now. This is a picture from ages, like 2006 or so. Maybe some of you were not born then. Uh, that's shared <laughs> caches, uh, memory controllers, uh, DRAM interface, memory interface, and memory banks. You don't need to know about all of these uh, terms at this point, but you can see that there are layers and layers of caches. In fact, there are caches inside these cores also. Uh, and memory controller we're going to talk about later in the course. That's an important piece of uh, the architecture that interfaces with the memory itself. And you've probably seen memory like this. How many of you have seen memory like this? Okay, excellent. That's good. That's not new, but you will see it at some point, and you will see it in this course. Don't get scared. If you don't understand a lot of what I'm going to talk about, again, don't get scared. We're going to build up to it at some point. But uh, I've shown you this slide before. It didn't always used to be like this. In the past, there used to be just a single core on a chip. But people started putting more cores, and this is the infamous IBM cell processor that's hard to program. Uh, but basically, people start putting simpler and low-power cores uh, that, are, that are simpler and low-power than a single large core. As a result, you get parallel processing on chip. You can do multiple things at the same time, right? Sounds beautiful. You can actually put your entire data center on a chip, maybe. That's, well, maybe that's too much, but people are thinking of things like that. Uh, so it's faster, and it can enable new applications if you do this. So what do you want? Ideally, it's always good to think about the ideal when you're an architect, I think. If you put these two cores on a chip, ideally you want two times the performance, right? You want both to speed up. At least together, you want both to speed up by a similar amount such that you get overall two times performance. Basically, we want n times the system performance with n times the course. So what do we get today? This is a result of an experiment that we did a long time ago while I was at Microsoft Research in Seattle. Uh, basically, we wrote up it as, as a security paper. But basically, this was on a system that was designed by Intel at the time, but we re replicate on AMD also. If you have two cores, you run two applications, MATLAB for some simulation, and GCC is a compiler. Don't worry if you've never used it. Uh, but we, we, measured this, we measured how much each of the applications slowed down when you're running them together on two cores. Basically, two applications are running on two processors at the same time, compared to when each application is run alone on a single core. So the baseline of, for MATLAB is you run it alone, you get an execution time, let's say 100 cycles, uh, 100 seconds, and then you run it together with GCC, it runs for 107 seconds. So it slows down by only 7%. Sounds pretty good, right? Uh, and GCC, when you run it by alone, it runs for, let's say again, 100 seconds. When you run it together next to MATLAB, it runs for 304 seconds. So it took three times longer. Sounds bad, right? First of all, neither of them improve in performance. 
But at least you should have both of them happen at the same time. So if they happen at the same time, if they both finish at 100 seconds, you get perfect speed up, right? 2x speed up. Both of them are slowing down. Maybe you expect that. First of all, why are they slowing down? Why, why, should, why shouldn't they both finish at 100 seconds, right? Wouldn't that be nice? That's the ideal goal. But clearly, they're both slowing down. But one is slowing down a whole lot more. So you actually, in the end, have a much worse system than what you've designed, right? You could run these two programs sequentially. First GCC, first MATLAB, and then GCC, and you get 200 seconds, plus or minus change. Now, both programs take 304 seconds to run. That sounds bad, right? So you change the operating system, you change stuff. Basically, whatever you do in the software, this stays the same. So we call this the memory performance hog. I'll ask you a question, uh, and maybe, or maybe two questions. Uh, can you figure out why there is a disparity in the slowdowns if you don't know how the system executes those programs? I hope your answer is no. <laughs> I guess this was a rhetorical question. Basically, you need to know what's going on underneath to explain a situation like this. And if you want to fix it, you need to know even more. Right. Uh, so why is this an important problem? Basically, people want to use these multi-core systems um, to execute multiple applications on the cloud. Let's say you have cloud computing today, and you submit your jobs. And somebody can be running MATLAB, somebody can be running GCC. And it turns out, if you, they run it together, if, if the two people run it together, you'll get much lower performance. So why not execute it on your computer? That's slow anyway. Why put it on the cloud, right? So it doesn't make sense to build a slower computer. So clearly something is happening underneath. Uh, why is it, there are two questions. Why, uh, actually, there are three questions that I figured right now. Why is there a slowdown to begin with? Second, why is there a disparity in slowdowns? Why are they different slowdowns? And why are they so wildly different? And how can we solve the problem if we do not want that difference in the slowdowns? I don't know if you want me to answer these right now. I don't think we can, just, we can do justice to it. Maybe I'll leave you with this. Maybe, maybe I'll do something. Oh, yeah, okay. Why is this important? Good, I have one more slide that, uh, that I can uh, build up uh, so that you can think about this at home. And I'm not going to put up the slides for the, tomorrow's lecture, so maybe you can think about it. So why is this important? Again, we want to execute more applic applications in parallel in multi-core systems. We want to consolidate more and more. Cloud computing is an example, but mobile phones is another example. Increasingly, people want to do more and more over here. When you're speaking, you want something else to happen also. And also, you want to, uh, the, one of the big reasons for having high-performance computers is you want to enable new applications. So we, we don't, maybe, I, I'm not an application designer, so I cannot imagine applications well. But if we can design computers much faster, so there are a lot of smart people in the world that can take advantage of it. And also, we want to mix different types of applications together. Those requiring quality of service guarantees, for example, video or pedestrian detection. If you have a self-driving car, You'd better have a quality of service guarantee in your pedestrian detection, right? Or car detection, or whatever detection you have around there, right? And those that are important, but less so. You want to mix all of these things together. And even within an application, if you have multiple different threads, they may have different requirements. And there are even less important applications like a virus checker, right? In fact, we did the same experiment with virus checkers. If you're running a very intensive virus checker, it can slow down something that's really important uh, for the user. So we want the system to be controllable in the end. Uh, OK, I'll give you with this picture, uh, and then you can think about why there's a disparity uh, in the slowdown. So this is the system design we examined. This was the core. This was another core. Caches were different. There was some interconnect. There is a memory controller. There is a shared bus that goes to memory. And there are a bunch of banks that you can operate in parallel. You don't know this, don't worry. Basically. This is, uh, you don't know all of these probably, don't worry about that. But basically, you can think of this as cache, putting the, keeping the data here. That's how, what you need to access to get the data out of them. So this part was shared. I'll give you the problem. That was the problem, basically. But I think we'll pick it up uh, tomorrow uh, to talk about exactly uh, what was the problem. But we're not done yet. <laughs> there you are. We'll take uh, five minutes to talk about the labs. In the meantime, think about those three questions. Like, why is there a slowdown? <laughs> why is there a disparity in slowdown? And how can you fix it? I'll ask you tomorrow. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. So while you're thinking about the questions, um, you can also ask me questions. So basically, um, I as well as...